There. Good. Hi. So uh, uh, I'm here with uh, Germana and uh, I'm Vince from Love Alive and really excited to be here with Germana. Germana, we used to uh, ride motorcycles together and had a really cool connection because you were all into the uh, subconscious mind work and so was I was more in the NLP way and you're more in the hypnosis way and, and that but it's always been kind of a thing and then recently I saw some of your videos on YouTube and I was like damn you've got some really good stuff going on especially uh in regards to like what my book's all about uh mastering excellence and recovery and i thought man this would be a really good interview if we could just kind of shoot from the hip a little bit have a casual conversation about some of the the pieces you have around that mm, thank you vince uh, it's super exciting to see you know, for whatever reason, we have both moved in our directions that's followed our, our journey. And we're both, I think, sharing a very, very similar message about how to thrive after the beginning or, you know, portions of putting our life back together in a way that makes life worth living. It's just fascinating because when I met you, I was like, he's doing the you know, same energy, same charge, right? Mm -hmm. Super. Similar. Yeah, very much the same. Very similar. similar. Kind of parallel paths or something like that so yeah really really cool um so would it be okay if i ask you a few questions about Absolutely. what you're doing sure you bet i'm super grateful to be here with you okay so so i really want to know what attracted you to want to understand and work with the subconscious mind wow that's a long one um when i was quite young i think i was about 16 or 17 maybe 18 i I was struggling and I was in a situation that was very um, toxic and damaging. And I remember being in a bookstore and I was attracted to this book by Louise Hay and it had these beautiful hearts on it, a rainbow heart. And it was, you can heal your life. And um, within the book, it had, you know, the messages about if you have this problem, this is a subconscious message that's being replayed in your body or your life. And this is the subconscious healing message that if you integrate that, you can heal this problem. And I was like, wow. And so I had the book and I read the book and I thought, this is amazing. This woman healed herself from cervical cancer with this type of model. And I thought I'm paying attention. And then years later, I had a teacher that was a uh, relative of Bruce Lee and he was my teacher and he took our whole school to a ravine show for fun. And I'm watching and two of the, his lead teachers, which were my sparring partners became part of the show. <laughs> And he brought them and he said, oh, you're in 1990 and you're doing whatever you do. And these two lead teachers that were my sparring partners were teaching for Han Lee, who was my teacher. And my and he brings them all into the future and he future paces them. And what are you doing? And what are you doing? And and uh, one of the women on this stage, he goes, what are you doing? And she goes, I'm embezzling money out of the business. And I'm like, wow. And my subconscious is showing me this picture. The corner of my eye would come up laterally of me teaching a warm up in a fitness class because I was doing that at the time. And um, so he took them all into the future. They did what they were going to be doing in that year and then took them all out of trance. And, you know, the two students, I knew them. I knew they weren't plants. I knew them personally. And the woman, she was an accountant. And I was just like, whoa. So you could see what her unconscious um, intention was. And what I got right there was that my subconscious was telling me, leave the school and practice and, and pursue fitness. That's what I was being told. And I left the school right after that. And then years later, one of my coworkers was um, doing hypnosis and it was a very authoritative style. And I didn't appreciate that, but that I didn't appreciate being treated like that because it was aggressive to me. And then I eventually went and found a really good school that brought me to an association that took me eight years of education and mentoring to become a certified clinical hypnotherapist, which is very rare. Most people get, you know, 50 hours, a hundred hours are like, here, you can help people now. And I'm like, wow. So mm -hmm. I had, you know, someone hold me through each of those segments, you know, they were my backup. And um, I actually got into it because I wanted to heal my own wounds. Yes. I knew that I was deeply wounded, but I didn't understand um, how I was the way I was. And as I um, learned how to learn how to love me and have compassion for me and to hear me and care for me. I knew that the only way that could happen, it wasn't through talk therapy. It was through deep emotional clearing, like really linking up emotions and repetition to heal the part of me that had split off from my childhood. And I 
saw it to be so successful and effective for me that I thought, my God, there's a whole, <laughs> there's no shortage of people that are suffering here. And then, you know, as I took my training and, and got better and better at it, I just got such a joyful reward out of helping, you know, this one person no longer want to die or no longer carry this guilt or no longer carry this hostility that was then turned on themselves. I call it self-grenading, right? If we have emotions that we don't deal with, we will go boom, well, it will destroy us somehow. So that was kind of how I got into it. And, and it's been, I think I've been in practice for 30 years now. Wow. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious, like sometimes um, I find NLP to be so effective that a person will come for a session and, and the transformation is so radical and amazing that they, they don't come back. So are you able to subsist yourself uh, income wise with hypnotherapy or is it just sort of a side thing that you do? You know, that's an excellent question. I usually have about 30 to 40 percent of my practice is doing therapeutic hypnotic work. Um, and the reality is the other part of my business is I do personal training and they always go like, this is so great because I get a personal trainer and a therapist at the same time wow. and I only have to pay for one. And every once in a while, someone will bring in a thank you for helping me with this problem. The other day, someone brought me a thank you um, card with a hundred dollars in it. And I was just so deeply moved. Wow. Um, but the thing is with this type of work and you're right, you help the person deal with it. And unless they have more problems you're done. They're done. It's finished. Yeah. And so then what I did for years was I would write articles in a magazine. Like I would write stories or information about hypnosis, what it was like, what it's for, not stage hypnosis, but therapeutics and evidence of what it shows up like in daily life. And that brought me thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people over time. And then that magazine and went digital and that was the end of that <laughs> oh mm. I, well people people want digital but when you market my experience digitally that's a very interesting process because people are fragmented they're going in different directions and for someone to actually kind of connect and listen number one they have to have a need and they have to be able to sit and process what's in front of them which is a trance and so reading is a uptime trance. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I started writing with another magazine that's in the couch and Valley. And now I'm just getting referrals from nurses and it comes and goes people coming in for trauma or um, mm -hmm. some people come in for smoking and some people come in because their attachment style is causing them a lot of grief. And I've done a lot of work in that area. So Instead of me giving them 150 questions to start, I sit, feel, listen, and ask a few questions. And I kind of know where I need to take them to regulate their nervous system so they can begin to trust themselves and then give them tools to reprogram themselves daily. And I'll record their session for them so they can use that to repeat, to repeat, to repeat, to reconnect with themselves. Um, most of the people that I see are disassociated from themselves and their power. They're looking for it by managing the outside world. I call that organizing the deck furniture on the Titanic. It, you know, <laughs> it, it moves energy around, but it doesn't do anything. And then as, right. we, as we get older, um, the things that we're trying to run away from start to get bigger and bigger because the subconscious wound is still there. And it's like a blackberry bush. And with time and practice with each person, if I'm given permission, I will help them take the root of the blackberry bush out. And then their natural self will um, take over that spot. Most of what I do is deprogram people, truly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that, that's something I want to talk a little bit about too, deprogramming, because um, I, I was blessed to be raised in a religious cult and, um, and needed to come out of that and you know um so i've written a book called um um healing from religious oppression and trauma and wow. i, I want to start doing group therapy with people um where you know deprogramming would be part of the thing so people have gone through residential school traumas people have been through cults 
um, and, and, and otherwise religious indoctrination power over type of, of, of piece. Hey? Um, so anyway, that, that hasn't totally developed yet. So maybe at some point we can talk a little more about that, especially about how to do that in a group setting. That would be really uh, a neat thing for me to talk with you about. Not today, but maybe in the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I have some more questions. Okay. Um, how has the work changed your life's direction? Like, um, how has waking up to the understanding that the subconscious mind helped both you and, and others heal? It's kind of like a... It's like a big life jacket and, and like another, like a fairy belt that says there's hope. Um, I need to understand my own, I call them default settings on my subconscious mind because what I realized is that I'd done a lot of work, but there were still these layers. It's like an iceberg. There's a layer and then there's another layer. And what I really struggled with um, when I understood my attachment style, which was called a disorganized, which is um, also known as fearful avoidant. That is, yeah, I'm not surprised. That's why I think we relate to each other. Um, <laughs> but what I, what I did was I took some um, relationship coaching on healing attachment um, traumas and things. And I recognized that I was still very easily triggered when I got into a relationship of feeling fearful uh, feeling like I'm going to be rejected of having this story is that I'm bad if I don't fawn or take care of the person. And those were all relationship dynamics I had with both of my parents who were both incredibly mentally ill. So I think at the subconscious, like a horse, you must learn how to ride the horse or you get bucked off and the horse just goes and does whatever it wants. So as I learned to tame my own horse that was scared and spooked, you know what spooked horses are like, and create that, um, how do I say that, that attunement, that connection, that compassion with self. Then when I would share that with someone in a soft, loving way, like I was also taught the cooperation approach, the Ericksonian approach, and someone comes in, I might talk to them for a while before they're ready to let me help them feel safe in their body. And so once I got that and I would build that part with them, then I would say, are you ready to maybe explore the root cause of the problem? It could be anything. I said, it's kind of like, let's just see what your subconscious comes up with. And one of my teachers who has passed away now, um, she taught me how to do the deprogramming just like that. Bang. She was a laser. She was amazing. She was the most mm. fierce, fierce um, courageous woman I ever met. She was my teacher for 18 years and I just love her. And so when I work now, I often feel that she kind of comes around and coaches me a little bit. But so once the client and I have that relationship and they feel safe, they trust themselves, they trust the process and they trust their subconscious, hot knife through butter. So like as an example, not that long ago, I had a man come and he was in his early sixties and he was a very dignified man. And he was a retired um, captain, like he drove the ferries and he was very no, no nonsense, very much like me, bang, 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 you know, shoot from the hip. And he had been, um, unfortunately, as a young boy um, in England, he had been groomed as a soccer professional by his coach, um, who his soccer coach was a pedophile. And so this, this had went on for a period of time and he had just buried it. And then he was stuck with this shame and this anger and this revulsion. And he kept having these flashbacks and he was very tortured by it. And he came to me, his wife, I'd helped his wife years before. I don't know who she is, but she said, you know, you should go see Germana. And I looked at him. I said, well, I don't know, eight sessions should do it. But if not, we can do more because <laughs> I'm like, you haven't done therapy. You haven't done any, that type of inner work. So I don't, I can't over promise here. So by the sixth, sixth session, I could tell he was prickly. So now he's kind of like, he's irritated with the process. So I said to him, I said, well, maybe today's the day we find out and maybe we clear that part of your life up. Are you okay with that? Because sure, you know, strong. And so I've got the connection and then I have the subconscious take us to the root cause and the pattern that's creating all of these emotional, com you know, conflicts within them and of course subconscious will take you there and we reviewed it and 
I helped him loop through it and helped him reconnect with his little boy and ask the little boy, what did you decide or what did you believe and and all the rest of it. And one of the um, root causes of this man's self-hatred was that he believed that he was stupid and it was his fault for getting caught into this dynamic. And I said to him to tell the little boy, I said, um, you didn't have a chance. You were dealing with a professional pedophile. That's like blaming someone for being eaten by a shark. I said, so it's important that you let that little boy know that it wasn't his fault and that he was very innocent and that he was lucky that he lived. Complete reframe. And of course, then the little boy could accept that. And then the shame and the guilt and the need to self-punish was gone. And so then I helped bring him through that out of it and then rewired the whole thing. So the emotions were completely gone. And the story about that I'm stupid and I'm bad because this guy did this to me, gone. And then he came out of trance and he looks at me and goes, that was the effing most amazing thing I've ever gone through in my life. I can't believe it. I feel amazing. He goes, I'll need at least three weeks to process this. I said, I'll see you in three weeks. And so he comes back in three weeks and he's got, you know, a whole different kind of swagger and he goes oh that was the best three weeks of my effing life <laughs> <laughs> I'm going away for the summer and I said great I'll see you when you come back and he wrote me the most beautiful testimonial oh. but that was all he needed because he wasn't skirting around it I just needed to have a sense of how do you feel safe in your body how do you connect to this other part of you this other part that is actually responsible for your emotions is responsible for your health the subconscious and the body and the little boy or the little girl are all the same. And that's the doorway to our spirit. That's a, that's a, that's the door out of the trappings of what our mind will do for us. <laughs> so in, in that case, um, I'm fired. I'm like fired. Ding. Universe send me someone else. <laughs> There's no shortage of people that are hurting. Um, and for me, I really sincerely believe this is that if I hadn't learned about how to do that work, I would have taken my life a long time ago. I was just so set up to fail. I was so set up to believe that I was a worthless, stupid, bad, evil person. And that's how my parents programmed me to keep me under their, their cloak, right? And it, I don't believe they did that because they were evil people. I thought they were just very damaged. They were born from World War II. So you live in a war zone. That's how your nervous system's set up. So everything is suspect of having its head cut off, mm -hmm. including the children. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just tragic. Uh, I had grandparents that went through the World Wars and one ended up in a concentration camp and another, my grandfather, he, uh, he actually, he, um, he would tell me these stories about how he ended up being like uh, one of the SS generals' um, uh, slaves, I guess, his cook. Oh, and, and the general would come home and he would be all drunk and he would go tuck him into bed, make sure he's sleeping. And then he would go back out around the back. Um, underneath the house was a storeroom there and he'd light a candle. And then all these um, like Polacks and Jews and things would come and he would feed them from his, from the general's stash upstairs. He would feed yeah. them cold cuts on rye bread with, with mustard in silence. Everybody's eating in silence, you know? Yeah, that was one of the stories he used to tell me. Yeah. I love but that story. The thing is, is like um, the, 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 the traumas that he experienced, you know, he ended up kind of lashing that out on like my uncle and things like that. My uncle ended up having a fractured um, um, uh, multiple personality, 14 different personalities when, he, when we buried him. Um, I've got paintings that are painted in all these different names by him and stuff. I love him. Love him to life. I got a, a great big picture I painted of him right here on my wall because he was such my art mentor and things. But um, but yeah, that that intergenerational trauma is something that really gets passed down. And uh, and 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 a lot of people look at that as such a hardship and they want, try to run from it. And 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 once we embrace it as being a gift. And our ancestors are like, here you go. Here's a gift. You can do it. We're going to watch you from the spirit realm and we're going to get healed as you heal. We're going to do it together. Okay. You know, and people don't quite understand that concept. And, and, and my first nations teachers say, you know, we, we heal seven generations back and seven generations ahead when we do our healing work in this life. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, very, very cool. I love, I'm loving where we're going with this. So who, who are your inspirations? Who are the people who inspired you to kind of do all this? Wow. Or what inspires you, period? 
I can't, I hate watching people suffer. Mm -hmm. I just hate watching people suffer. And um, I think what I unconsciously kind of set myself up as I, and this is a wound, but it's no longer, there's no more wound. It's just scar tissue. But I always thought that if I helped my parents, they would love me. Mm -hmm. I was a little girl. Like I taught my mother how to speak English. My dad was a genius and he spoke seven languages fluently, but he was completely unstable. And so I always wanted to understand what made people tip. Like, how do you do that to your child and say that's parenting? Like, I don't know what that means. So Louise Hay was my very first inspiration. And then, you know, I'd, I'd met some really cool teachers that I, and Richard Bandler and John Grinder. I took their training. I took their training in Richmond years and years ago. Um, and I loved studying Ericksonian hypnosis. Um, and what I loved was just seeing the changing people. It's like their spirit comes back to life. Um, now some of the people that really inspire me do like energy work and mediumship and clairvoyant work and um, psychic work. And, and because that's all dealing with the subconscious and superconscious, I fit right into that pocket. One of the ladies that I'm taking direct training from is Nicole Powell, and she's a reverend in a local medium here. And I, I knew I knew how to do it but I needed someone to guide me through the micro steps so I would cause no harm. Mm -hmm. And, and um, like when people sit with me now, I can sit there and I get images pop, 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 and I'll say something and they'll burst into tears. I'm like, okay, I guess it's accurate. Mm -hmm. um, but the channel's clean. Like I, uh, I just think it's my responsibility to make, to create a better planet even if I'm just starting with me. And then when somebody's ready, that lifeboat's out there and they can jump on and wheel in and then they might get stronger and then they can be a lifeboat and a beacon of hope for someone else. Um, most of my teachers are dead. Most of the teachers that I've had. And I think that's why I went to the um, spiritual, deeper spiritual work because I would often have visits, <laughs> dreams, he would come through, they'd often bring me a candle and a conversation. Mm. Even my father, who's passed, he would come through and ask for forgiveness. And I just tried my best. And then I got to a place where it was weakening me because I couldn't say that I was enraged by what had happened. And then I was instructed how to process that repressed anger and that injusticeness over a period of months by someone who said some things are unforgiven, unforgivable. And I'm thinking if I can't let this go, that brings us together in our next lifetime. It's this is the glue that pulls you back in. And so um, he was very specific every day for at least one minute to three minutes, pretend he's in the room and you tell him what you think and just let it out. Bop, 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 bop. And I did. And then he said, now pretend that there's a, uh, a court case and, you know, he's on the stand and you're telling the jury what happened to you with him. So there's mm -hmm. justice, emotional justice. And then eventually it just fizzled. And I was like, I'm complete now. And then we were doing some work together in this mediumship group and we would pair up. So I would read the girl, she would read me. And of course, my father comes through and, mm -hmm. um, He's saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I had brain damage. And, and then I'm so proud of you for breaking the generational trauma and um, for taking yourself out of the cage I put you in. And, you know, he kept saying, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. And I thought, wow. And I believed it. And I feel him right now. But I could feel him come. And he would just bring this energy of this lightness. And I would ask a question. Was my father... Um, like trafficked by his father. And I kept getting this strong yes. And I thought, my God, right? Because they were so poor. They were beggars in occupied Italy. They had nothing. They were beggars and thieves. You're making my eyes leak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, right. he hurt me so badly. And after he died, he would come around. He would come around. And I thought, what the blank do you want? Like, it was like, I got, you know, what I inherited at, quarter million dollar therapy bill <laughs> which is what drew me to hypnosis i'm like this talk therapy stuff has taken way too much time <laughs> and i wanted to feel better and i didn't want to limp along and fragment decades of my life repeating the patterns that i was taught to accept as normal 
you know, and now there's a few people that I'm really attracted to that I listen to, like on YouTube, like I love Paul Check. He's all about spirituality and Marie Manu Cherry, she's a healer. And, you know, she was a nurse and she's a healer and she's brilliant. And I just love it because she's like, she asks about energy. What's the energy? What are you doing? Are you falling in love with yourself? Are you allowing yourself to ask yourself, not your mind, but your body, what brings you joy? And the more that I would do that, the more I would let go of the rigidity of thinking I must protect myself. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I let go of a job that I'd had for a long time. I gave the business away because it wasn't bringing me joy. I felt like a circus bear performing and it wasn't honoring my soul's work. And my soul's work now is to help people heal, have boundaries, get their needs met and be in their true capacity of power and self, self love, I guess. But our life doesn't work if we don't love ourselves. So, I mean, I've gone through quite a few teachers. I've had like a lot. And, and it's weird because it just reminds me that I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as I understand the subconscious mind, it deletes, generalizes and distorts information based on your past experience. And so like mm -hmm. it kind of files like that, that information away in a certain certain way of the belief that it made up at the time of the incident, whatever that might be. And then it just stores it away. It's like all men are bad. All dogs are bad. You know, they have little four-year-olds walking to school. There's two of them. And, and then one four-year-old looks at this big dog barking and charging at him and gets <clears throat> seized up like this. Well, the other one has a dog at home and it's like, yeah, it's no big deal. Yeah. And, and that was always the, the piece around, especially in the rooms of recovery. Uh, I've always looked around the rooms and it's like, this person over here was, was gang raped by her brothers all her life and she's fine. And this one over here was touched by an uncle once and, and she's all tweaked out. And, and, and these, these kind of things would, would just have, have been a big fascination for me is like what we perceive or what we believe um, is, is, is going on, the meaning that we give things, right? And so that kind of leads me into my, my next question is like, how is the healing the subconscious subconscious programming of your childhood and generational trauma impacted you i'm completely free from it like i really feel totally free from it i can still get triggered um like i have a partner in my life and i see him sometimes for a little bit of time and my nervous system will flag and i will start jumping and going what do i need to do so you're happy so i can relax which is a trigger mm -hmm. the quality of my life is amazing like i I'm healthy, you know, I, I don't create financial chaos or financial drama anymore. I don't use shopping for therapy. I don't use food for therapy. I don't use, um, you know, lewd posts on Facebook for recognition. I don't do those things. But there was a time that I was so wounded and didn't know how to fill those buckets up that said I matter, that I'm loved, that I'm safe. Um, that I can trust life, that I can trust myself. I didn't know how to fill those buckets up. So I was still trying to organize the deck furniture on the Titanic, which is the old program. And the biggest program that I had was that I wasn't wanted. So I had to earn acceptance. Mm -hmm. And now I don't care if someone doesn't like something I say or do. I said, that's okay. That's your stuff. I don't have to fix it. Like that's your story. I live a really wonderful life. You know, I didn't have anyone rescue me. I had lots of people come and take chunks of my liver, very much like my family. And then the liver had to heal, right? But I was repeating childhood abuse. Right. I was repeating what was normal. And I believe if we don't heal that, we can't not repeat it because the subconscious is responsible for 97% of our behavior. And the conscious mind just watches the, the drawbridge, let it in, let it in, let it in, or don't, or stop it, or whatnot. And if we're not aware, we just go on default settings. Um, like I live a fabulous life. My, my brother who, you know, same family, no true recovery. You know, he phones me and his life is out of control and he's desperate and he's angry and he's scared and he's not well. And he tries to see if he can get me to engage in victim consciousness. And I'm like, no, actually, my life's doing really well. And I'm teaching these co the corporate workshops, you know, boundaries or burnout. I won't tell him too much because it'll just make him want to, you know, stick his head in the door. And the only difference between him and I is I stopped using when I was quite a lot younger. And I was willing to see why my body had all these emotions. And then the, the, the pieces of the puzzle started to come together. And I went, oh, my God. You poor thing, because I'd 
it was all buried and I would get information and then it was like you poor thing and I was starting to learn how to have a relationship with that part of me that was silenced you know um so I don't know if I went off track there but for me um my life is great like I I have a beautiful home that I pay for with my own money doing my own job it's paid for in full I have a car that's paid for I have a motorcycle that's paid for I make applesauce with my own apples from the tree outside I pick mushrooms I'm a little bit of a a little bit of a hippie check and I'm pretty happy and I don't engage in people's stuff I'm like what do you want to do about it I'll listen to them a few times and then I'll say, are you willing to let this go? Are you ready to take some power back and kind of wake them up to their true self? Like keep people away from this thing. <laughs> so yeah, I heard it said once that uh, the worst thing you can hear a person with addiction say is I've been thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's grab a hammer. It hurts less. Right. Yeah. 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 So, mm -hmm. Um, I have another question. It, is this a one and done type of therapy or is this like a, a, a practice? I think that's an excellent question. And depending on how aggressive the application is in some situations, um, it can be a one and done. But um, some people aren't ready for that. And I don't typically do that with someone like my teacher. Here's an example. She was so efficient. We'll call that efficient psychiatrist would send her clients and the psychiatrist would say, whatever you do, don't get rid of the root cause, just help them manage the symptoms. And my teacher was just fearless. <laughs> so she would in one session go, what's the root cause of the problem? Bang, 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 bang. And the client would clear it, resolve it, you know, before, or before, during, or after your birth, cleared clients free. And the psychiatrist in such an egomaniac and, and shame would phone her screaming, I specifically told you not to get rid of the root cause of the problem. And she would say, now, surely there's enough people that need help that you can let this one go. <laughs> so she would just put him right in his place. And it was his ego, because this is this little woman in her 70s and 80s doing what he can't do in 20 years with a client. Because she would just know which how to ask the question and the person was disarmed because you she gives you ginger snaps and tea and then asks you some pretty strong questions. For me, in my life, I have a daily practice. Every morning I do a meditation. I do some work to reconnect with my subconscious mind so I feel nourished, nourished and loved because I had so much trauma that if I don't do that, I'm easily triggered by the world and the people. So, so you do a ritual? Every day. Uh -huh. And I, I was taught to do that by one of my mentors and so if you clear a root cause with someone, they're done for that root cause. It's done unless there's another layer deeper, deeper, but usually it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. So it can be either side of that um, teeter totter. And then, you know, someone like my teacher, she was powerful and I just loved her. And, and I know someone, Richard Bandler would go, well, how much does it cost you to have this problem? And the person would tell and how much money have you spent and how many years and what is that worth? And he would say, well, so do you think spending $50,000 to get rid of it, do you think that's enough? And, and when the client would agree, then he would get rid of it in one session and get paid $50,000. <laughs> that's right. And that's how he became the, the highest paid uh, uh, coach or something in the thing at the time. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. He was very, very, he knew what to do. And other people would call him unethical. I'm like, how do you call unethical on that? Keeping someone in a sick place where they're constantly weakened and constantly not feeling well and constantly in misery, like for years, I don't think that's ethical. I think that's extortion. And I think that's unkind, you know? Yeah, and, and that's actually doing them a big service because that financial uh, implication of paying that to have that resolved is perfect. Exactly. It's just perfection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was right. just brilliant at stacking the questions correctly and, and getting the client to go, well, of course I can spend that kind of money. He'd go, well, if I can get rid of it, will you pay me that? Yes. Boom. Done. Mm -hmm. And that right. was the efficiency of that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's, if I usually have eight sessions with someone, whatever they came with is long gone and they've mm -hmm. got lots of warm, fuzzy stuff, but I don't set it up to try to do too much at once. Cause I know that that's kind of intimidating. 
And I always wanted to do it in a really loving way. Again, giving what I wanted. I wanted to be supported. I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be validated and then help me heal this part that's broken, right? Mm -hmm. And I I love how you're talking about um, the attachment piece because it usually run them through the attachment quiz on the attachment uh, project uh, dot org, I think it is, and um, and figure out what attachment style is first. And that kind of that kind of speaks to how they're going to be working with me after that. You know, I love it. I love it. So mm-hmm. um, another question I have is how can you tell if someone's in trouble and needs assistance? Like, what are the obvious signs? Wow. Um, if they become suicidal or homicidal, um, you know, and if that happens, then they need to go to the hospital. And I recently had that happen with a woman who was just so sad and so upset and so she was constantly going, I need to have other people love me. And if they love me, then I'm okay. And if I can't get them to love me, then I'm worthless. Um, what I saw happen for her, and this just, it so sad. Um, she wasn't willing to break the trance and rescue herself. She really just was so rigid. And um, she had been through a relationship that was very narcissistic. So that relationship depleted her so completely that she had a complete nervous breakdown. And she was instructed to stay away from that man. because she was trying to get love back by giving. It wasn't clean. It wasn't, there was no balance. It was like, I will give everything I have. So you will love me. And that was her model that was as a child. And then unfortunately she tried to take her life with a whole bunch of pills and she ended up in the psych ward and, you know, I went to visit her and I brought her some things to sort of help her kind of have some comfort. And then they gave her um, shock therapy. And I was just shocked. Like I was like anything better than that. And she just says, oh, I'm going to do what the psychiatrist says. And I'm like, wow, we're going to elect- electrocute your brain. Great. That freaked me out. So she's kind of in a different place now. And um, that's the only time I've ever seen that. But it was disturbing because I... I think she just wanted attention. So then she did that and her children found her, you know, almost dead in the bathroom and she got attention, but it wasn't her saying I need support or, um, you know, it was very, very passive aggressive and then very aggressive against herself. She was trying to kill herself and she's still alive, but the quality of her life is probably pretty low. Wow. Yeah. So, so how does a person get a hold of you if they want to, We'll do some uh, navigating through their inner subconscious mind. I do have a website. It's um, hypno and then the number four health.ca. Mm-hmm. And some people will find me through Facebook and some people will just send me, you know, an email. Um, and my email is G and then at my first name, germana.ca. Um, a lot of people come as referrals. I mean, someone's come in and they've, just it didn't work you know it worked for them here where they felt seen and validated and stronger um and I'll put little things out like I'll put little stories out and sometimes it just gets in front of the right person and I often I just say to the universe send me the people that I can help you know that can afford my services that I can help yeah Mm -hmm. see this uh this talks about a little bit about that clear channel uh piece you know, uh, I'm a sun dancer. I, I pour sweat lodges for the people, I carry a bundle, carry a pipe for the people, all that sort of thing. And 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 my teachers have said, you know, you got to be a hollow bone. Ooh. And a hollow bone, a hollow bone is a clear channel to spirit. So you can't have any like, um, you know, oftentimes with people who 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 have addictions they will okay i've given up my drug of choice yay i'm no longer stuck on the cocaine and then they're over to the netflix binges or they're on the smoking train or you know what i'm saying addiction switching so the idea around that is sort of like you can't have any like little bit of porn stuff going on the side or you can't have a little bit of you know looking at other women or you know whatever that might be you you got to be that hollow bone you got to be so calm and still and healed in yourself that you're capable of being that direct conduit to creator so that creator can come down and do that healing work through you as a vessel 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I've got a big story around that, but I, I can't really share it here online, but I'll share it with you sometime um, in person. But um, I want to share it just to, to tie that with a ribbon on it. Like I listened to a very powerful healer that everyone knows his name, John James Von Prague. And he said, our spirit, the amount of our spirit that's in our body when we're here is about our thumb and the rest of our spirit is up there. And that's why when people that work in that type of work do sitting in their power or they do certain types of meditation to get quiet. So they are a clear channel. And that when we do that, and we allow ourselves to receive the love from the other side. We're so bathed in love that we recognize that's all we really are. And the rest of it's learned mm-hmm. um, scripts. And then, you know, we come back to the earth and we shake ourselves off and go, okay, either I'm going to step into the role that I was assigned as a child or whatever, or I'm going to allow my spirit to work through me. And I love that. Mm-hmm. But it's, I love the hollow bone. I mean, it's the same thing. You have to leave space for love to come through. Because that's what we really are. The rest of it is a story. Mm-hmm. You know? And we've had experiences. Yes, we've been hurt. Yes, we've hurt people. Part of the deal. Yeah. 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 Are you mm-hmm. are, are you comfortable with me asking you some really neat questions? Oh, sure. Yeah. Awesome. Mm-hmm. So I've got some neat questions. What inspired you to write Mastering Excellence in Recovery? And how, how does it differ from the traditional recovery approaches like the 12-step model? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so like for one, I, I really like to poke fun at myself. I mock myself a lot in the book as a teaching tool to open the hearts of others to the similarities in the self that they might have, you know, so it kind of normalizes our human condition. Yeah. Um, I've been on my recovery journey for 17, just about 18 years. And um, while this 12-step model helped me a lot in the beginning, I realized there was gaps, you know, that needed to be addressed for deeper, long-lasting recovery. Mm-hmm. I wanted to offer a more holistic approach that integrates the mind, the body, the spirit, allowing individuals to go just beyond abstaining from compulsions. Mm-hmm. Mastering Excellence in Recovery blends my years of experience in therapy, group facilitation, ancient wisdom studies, Qigong practice, and spiritual healing to offer an evolved model that includes practices like somatic healing, emotional fluency, and connection to nature and spirituality, which mm-hmm. aren't typically found in traditional recovery programs. Like I, I wanted more. And, and I mean, that, that was even what I was seeking as my role uh, as an addict. Um, more was my drug of choice and preferably yours because I was selfish that way. <laughs> and then, and then, then what's a recovery around five years clean? I wanted more from recovery. And I, and I kept on seeking in these spiritual uh, paths, you know, neuroscience, quantum mechanics, where I discovered that I was entangled. <laughs> um, I finally landed in two spiritual paths where I don't feel any more seeking is required. So I'm involved with Tawa shamanism as a Qigong instructor and, uh, and, and in the original Sioux teachings of the Lakota people. So at 55 years old, I finally stopped seeking things outside myself. Now I seek it within myself and my council of helpers that I've been, that I've been blessed to have gathered around me, you know? I love the, um, the part about, you know, connecting with nature and because that's, I think, where we get fed. Mm -hmm. Like I think that, and that, that's very, very rare. Like a lot of us are the digital world. We're always looking outside and not knowing how to find the gold is in here. The real gold is our relationship with ourself and our spirit and natures. I love that. Um, Can you explain? Even when I was in Vancouver, uh, to kind of just around sort of the beginning of COVID and I, and I was kind of starting to get a little almost like itchy bitchy and twitchy in, in myself and I didn't know really what that was but it felt like just the, the 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 white noise of the city and all those kind of things was just getting to be a little little too much so we ended up moving out here to the country I live on an acreage here I got elks in my yard we got a great big garden it's just gorgeous I got two big mountains here big river right behind my house oh my god it's gorgeous Wow. and quiet yeah and i've been able to really find that that inner stillness here whereas in the city with all the chaos it's just like ooh, yeah, i couldn't do it i just felt like it. nature and i yeah been able to do the work here i am um, 
identify with that. I don't have that privilege at this point. And I recognize the value of learning how to regulate our nervous system because when there's too much stimulation, the nervous system can get triggered and then the mind starts to act and then the mind will run and run and run. And then the person is basically at the, at the mercy of this toxic environment. And unless we have those boundaries, like that spiritual practice that says, I'm taking care of myself, I'm holding space for myself, I am sacred, I'm whole and complete, then the unconscious and the nervous system will start to get attuned to all of the chaos. And it part of us will if we're not careful, become um, weakened by that. So yeah, I envy you. I was like, wow, that's amazing. As soon as they put the smart meter on my house, my nervous system went crazy and I did everything I could to have them take it off and I couldn't get them to take it off and I felt violated. Right. And, and, and for me, it was when they flipped on 5G. In fact, everyone in our house, all of a sudden, as soon as they flipped on 5G, everybody was getting nightmares and craziness. I'd be sitting on the toilet, watching my eyes, my ears just go totally red and they were burning. And I'm like, what is oh, going no. on? You know, but we were triangulated between three of uh, those, those towers, right where we lived there by the p and &E, And it was like, this is too much. We're out of here. <laughs> so we moved the whole family out here. <laughs> oh, that is wise. That is wise. Your time was brilliant. Um, I want to ask you a question. Can you explain what that, so as I've got to just question evolved recovery. And I think you are explaining it beautifully. Can you explain what that means and how it integrates practices like Qigong and first nation spirituality? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so evolved recovery is, is, is about addressing the deeper roots of addiction, things like disconnection and resolved trauma and emotional repression. Mm -hmm. It's a, it, it's like an integrative path that helps blend modern therapeutic techniques and ancient wisdom mm. it, it shows how abstinence does not equal recovery <laughs> for example qigong offers a, a powerful way to reconnect the mind and body allowing for the emotional and physical healing um, when it comes to first nation spirituality this brings in the element of wichone so that's a lakota word for sacred mm. ceremony sacred rituals and respect for the interconnectedness of all beings which helps people reconnect with something much larger than themselves while remembering that we're all connected. And like uh, the idea is like when one suffers, we all suffer. When, when one has blessings, then we can all praise and honor that up, you know? So when we, when we start combining all these elements, Evolved Recovery offers a, a transformative process that helps individuals not only recover, but thrive. Oh and have an unshakable peace beyond all comprehension, no matter what storm they're facing. So like fundamentally it's, it's grown, it's grown far beyond the disease model of addiction where recovery rates are exceptionally low and people are dying these days at ridiculously high rates and, and, and the introductions of new substances out there, like, oh my God, it's unbelievable. And, and evolved recovery was birthed after facilitating wellbriety step groups for years and noticing that everyone that did one of these ceremonial versions of the steps with me in my circles were staying 100% clean. Wow. I realized I had the medicine out past just working with the First Nations people and out to the greater world to be inclusive of all people. And, and, and just for perspective, I'm told the leading 12 step fellowship is calculated at an 11% recovery rate, which means that they work a set of steps and they stay clean for one year only after that. It's not very good numbers in my opinion. And yet everyone who's taken these things with me and, and we're dealing with people who have massive intergenerational trauma from colonization and everything like that. It's unbelievable. And I was doing one of these groups, you know, and at one point, um, um, we, we'd finished all the readings. There's, there's six major readings that we do before we even jump into step one. And then we went to the sharing circle there at, at the end. And this guy, he just starts dumping all of his stuff. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, we're not on step four, but when a person's holding that eagle feather, they're the one who's talking. So I couldn't interrupt. <laughs> and then he passes his eagle feather to the next guy. And the next guy does the same, just oh, puts yeah. it all out there. And then the next guy. I just sat back. There's 20 people in this group. I just sat back and went, this is miraculous. You know, it was unbelievable. And everybody stayed clean because we do it in this real ceremonial way. We do it with song. We have the, the, the sacred fire going there. We it, like when I did it at Culture Saves Lives on Bank, in, in downtown Vancouver, we have a great big medicine wheel painted on the floor and all the guys would sit in a circle around it. It was magnificent. And right outside the door is Pigeon Park 
where all these people are using and abusing. One time there was a big, huge, um, like fight out there. There was just like crazy fight. And here we are doing the sacred work right beside him with a little piece of glass right in between us. It was awesome. Talk about contrast. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So one, of the, eh? one of the things that I was really, um, it riveted me when I started to do the other layers of deprogramming, the messages that were, you know, self-shaming and self-guilting that were part of my attachment style. And I, as I healed those, I realized the label disease didn't apply to me at all. And I actually struggled um, to sit in that, in that, in that environment, unless I would say, you know, I'm a recovering person um, because I felt like I was devaluing the work that I'd done. And I, you know, I'd open this, this this chest with all of these jewels and I'd say, you know, trauma is not a disease. And if we can't honor how it changes the lens, how we show up in the world, and we can't say, this is what I've been taught to see, if we can't change that and go, what if you let that go? And, you know, what if you allow yourself to have a new reality? Otherwise, we're just brainwashed. We're programmed again, deeper into a self-shaming, self-guilting prison. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And if there was any piece I clipped from this video that was right there, mm. that's exactly the message. You know, my son goes to this really cool group, and I, I used to go uh, watch him chips and stuff there and, and go visit him once in a while. And they introduced themselves as recovered. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the group says, I'm a recovered alcoholic. Right. So they're not pigeonholing themselves and claiming that old disempowered state anymore. They're like, no, that's behind me. Yeah. Here's the part in the big book that says how millions have recovered from alcoholism. Yeah. Well, and, and the it. thing is, is if we if we change to how we say and what we say and what we feel, then we show up as different people, right? But um I'm some of the stuff that I've watched, and this isn't to be mean, but some of the stuff that I've watched people with significant decades on that horse riding in that direction have cancer 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 lots of self-abandonment and the body then starts to break down because there is no intimacy with self i'm an addict i'm bad and i've got to do all these things to atone for it and run around and fix and help people i'm like you need to be looking in the mirror because that's the person who needs some help and that's the person that needs some compassion and that's the person that needs to see that they're that their life matters and it's not about being somebody else's taxi cab right mm -hmm. and i know that those things are good at certain points in our early stages if we need them but at the end of the day a part of us is crying to be heard and to be seen and to be considered and the more that i started to do that i actually was getting very high protest from my little girl it was like that's not you you don't belong there but that got you here so this is good <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it was so heartbreaking for me. I used to go to this, uh, this fellowship at the Native Friendship Center for NA um, and, and, and a beautiful little group of about 89 people or something like that. And we'd all sit in a circle, you know, the First Nations way. And we had a smudge bowl going there, still an NA meeting. But, and then sometimes when people would take chips or whatever, somebody would bring a drum. So I actually made a drum and gifted it to that meeting and painted on it and did a real nice job. And so oh. they, they would always just really hold and honor each other up in a really good way. And one winter, we had 12 deaths in that home group. <gasps> Oh my God, it was devastating. Mm -hmm. All these overdoses and two suicides. Mm -hmm. One guy just picked up a joint and smoked it and had a little fentanyl in it. See you later. Yeah. You know how many hundreds of people I have buried since being in recovery? Mm -hmm. I, I can't do this anymore. That model is just not working for me. But the, I found this thing that's working really well. And so this is why I want to take it out and help people, right? Right. Is, is that what the M-E-I-R is, the emotional fluency piece? No, M-E-I-R means Mastering Excellence and Recovery. But the, the subtitle of the book, the subtitle of the book is for people with five or more years clean and sober. Oh, I love that. Because they set, they, they have a certain set of problems and they've been able to be abstinent for a while. Now let's kick the game up. Let's take that level and I'll be curious about what true 
means. What does re true recovery mean? For me, it means resorting back and, and regressing back to that innocent little child, that little little infant, that little two-year-old, that little three-year-old, and that, that little beamer of golden light energy that goes out before all the trauma started coming on. Mm -hmm. and, that's and what recovery means. Integrating that part. I get it. Me too. Mm -hmm. Me too. And I think that's why we're kind of in the same energetic um, path. Um, yeah. Have you have you put your book like into circulation so people can find it? Have you ever tried to publish a book? It's a racket. It's oh my God. I know. I get it's it. Like, are you kidding? I published on Amazon. It was up for a while. And then I thought I'm going to make a paperback and a hardcover out of it. So I make a paperback and a hardcover. I got all the software, learned how to do it, did the whole thing. And then <laughs> uh, that was for my book, uh, men's introductory to emotional fluency. And oh. then, and then they, Amazon sends me a letter and they say, oh, we noticed there's illegible text on the page 149, 82, and 92. And you need to fix that or we're going to shut you down. And I'm like, illegible text? I go back into my manuscript, no illegible text. I go into my KDP software, no no, no illegible text. And then I try to go into my account to see what the heck they're yeah, talking about. I'm locked out of my account. So so then so then I send their lawyer a, a thing and I say, hey, uh, what, what, what is this? He says, oh, don't worry. You just send in this form letter to Amazon. We'll take care of it from there. It'll, it'll be okay. I send in the form letter. Three days later, I hear back from Amazon. They say, you're banned for life because we never heard back from you. What? Oh. what is this? So anyway, I hired a publisher. I hired him to do a bestseller package for me. And I said, okay. so this is the price and, and you're never going to vary from this price. This is it, right? Yeah, this is it. And then three months in, they say, oh yeah, we need another $1,760 to copyright your cover. And I'm like, that wasn't in the agreement. That's not in the quote. That's not, ah. So I'm just in kind of one of those places where I don't know um uh, i'm an autobiography which is written under an alias um and it's called hi my name is mark and i'm a recovered jehovah's witness and that's the truth wow. um that one's going to hey hosts publisher balboa press and they're forty five thousand dollars usd to um do a bestseller package but that's where that one's going yeah as soon as i wrote it because i had to do it for counseling school as soon as i wrote that um that was kind of the base and now i'm keep writing more and more therapeutic lenses over the top of it so so to talk about you know my experience as like being kind of like a manic depressive child and and how i was perceiving things you know that the what i call perception medicine you know and uh and how can we reframe our perceptions this is the story that we had before now how do we restory that you know and and and, and create the restoration that we really need for ourselves yeah our dignity, our dignity and our authenticity yeah yeah i'm 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 um i've i've had my own story with you know publishing and stuff and um i find that whole world to be very very predatory unfortunately oh. i had uh, one woman who she had a bestseller in town and it was on Amazon and it was about fitness. And I'm thinking, I asked her, I said, what, tell me a little bit about the, the house that you used. And she sent me the link and I had a conversation with this woman <laughs> and she basically said, it's this much hundred nine hundred dollars US a, a month. And it'll take about 18 months. It might take longer, but da, da, da. and I added it up. And I said, well, that's about by the time the smoke clears, I'm out about 45 grand. So that's the second mortgage on my house. And so then I said, thanks, I'll get back to you. And then I reached out to the woman just out of curiosity because I'm like, did you break even? Did you make money or do you owe money? She would not respond. So I knew she had a big financial wound. And what I was struggling with was I'm not going to hurt myself financially trying to be grandiose or trying to, you know, hope that this is the home run. And I think that's the danger for people that have a book because, and forgive me for saying this, um, of course, we want our product to be seen and absorbed and, and help people because it is a tool for healing. It gives people hope. It's powerful. I mean, stories are therapeutic. Stories are hypnotic. All stories are a form of waking hypnosis. Um, but then what happens to many people is they get sold the idea that if I spend this money, you're going to make me famous. And it's not true. It's a not true story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a New York Times bestseller, which I think is like whatever it is, 20,000 copies in the first week or something. Wow. But then there's 
Amazon bestseller, which is like 800 copies in the first week. And all I care about is just having bestseller status. I don't really care. I don't need the big accolades right out of the gates, but I do need to have a bestseller status for the first book because I have written 11, uh, pardon me, 11 other books. Um, so, so if the first one's a bestseller, then the next ones will sell pretty good, you know? So that's kind of why I feel like it's, um, you know, when you go into a restaurant, uh, let's say, uh, let's say you go down to Vegas and you walk in for their $5 prime rib, all you can eat. Right. <laughs> and, that, and, and that's called the lost leader. So, so that's their offer. That's like their giveaway. And then you come in and spend all the money gambling in the casino. So they're going to make that money back that way. So that's kind of what a book is. You're just going to, that's an investment in yourself to position yourself as an expert. And I'm no expert, by the way, because an X is a has been and a spurt is a drip under pressure. And I'm not that. <laughs> but but basically, um, it, it kind of gives you that that clout or that way to kind of stand up and say, hey, yeah, this is who I am. I, and, and other people say, I know what I'm talking about. So, so therefore, I, I am that. I am. <laughs> I think it gives people a relatability. This person understands things that are not taught in a therapeutic course. I mean, based on the book, there's information and evidence. This person's walked the walk. They're not just what we could, would call as a stuffed shirt with a certific certification or a degree. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people that have that and they're smart as ever, but that doesn't mean they understand the experiential part of healing. And without the experiential part of healing, it's just words because- right. You're riding a horse with that person. You're getting in the canoe with that person and you're helping them navigate something that they don't understand yet. Right. Yeah, yeah. precisely. So so kind of one of my next moves that I'm looking at doing is creating a marketing agency to market. Both uh, my wife has developed some, some amazing courses which we'll be delivering together. Uh, and, and I've developed this other thing on the side over here, which is recovery because she doesn't know much about that. She's a normie. And, um, and, and, and so I want to create a marketing agency to be able to do, um, to, to market our courses. I want to get this stuff out to the five English speaking countries. And yeah. I feel like if, if publishing is such a racket, and I'm just going to keep throwing money at the wall, hoping it'll stick. Oh, I'm just yeah. going to like say to heck with that. I'm going to take out a sales funnel, sell my own book without an ISBN number and uh, uh, sell a low cost thing. And then I'm, I'm email addresses at the same time, developing an email list. And it's kind of almost like a no brainer to me. It seems like a much simpler way of going about it. Sell any book for four ninety five, dollars regular, you know, whatever it is, $40. And you can have it today for four ninety five, And then, yeah. And I mean, who isn't going to spend five bucks on a great book on recovery? You know, that's kind of how I'm looking at it. So it, 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 it and you're not going to make a lot of money even on that. You're, you're yeah. lucky to break even. You make a bit of a profit. However, you're developing the email list and the email list is gold. Once you have 10,000 people on your email list, you don't ever have to worry about working ever again. So Brilliant. That's, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You can just sell them whatever you got up your sleeve that day and they'll buy it kind of thing. You know, <laughs> a certain percentage will buy it. So if you have 10,000 on there and only 1% um, buy, how much money is that? Uh, I think that's 50 grand. I could be wrong. My math isn't always brilliant. I reserve the right to be wrong. <laughs> uh-huh. So Doesn't if you matter. If you did one of those um, uh, once a week for a month, you know, you'd probably be sitting all right. Could you get by on it maybe? Sure. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So there's little workarounds in, in, in some of this stuff, and that's kind of the little workaround I've seen. I've already thrown a ton of money at the book, and it's like, okay, it's this isn't, this isn't going anywhere. Unless I get, like, maybe Gabor Mate and sit down with him and say, hey, would you write uh, the foreword for the book? And would you do this and that? Because there's quite a bit about plant medicine and things in there because that's beginning to be kind of a topic in this day and age is plant medicine yeah. and recovery. And it's like, oh, you can't, you know, uh, mess yeah. up your mind, uh, mind altering substances or whatever they call it. So I address that in the book quite a bit too. And uh, and uh, yeah, anyway, long story, but it's a, it's a good one. Once we well, get I'm sure that your story can support and help men learn to trust and build a new relationship with themselves because I think men are taught to be silenced and they they die they suffer and they die because they don't have a place to be true to themselves or they're, they're wearing the mask I must be strong I must be this I must be that I'm not allowed to be scared or hurt or be like a failure or whatever and when those things can be left away like on on the table or on the floor and they can just get in touch then they they can reclaim themselves and men need role models. Like I think men got screwed over pretty hard. I mean, I would have a hard 
on. Yeah. I've, I've been doing these things locally here. Um, and I call it the, 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 the men's peaceful warrior circles. And wow. it's called the man cave of vulnerability. So it's where these guys wow. come in to get wow. in touch with their feelings because I'm lucky. Most of the men clients that I have, I'm lucky if I get mad, glad, or sad out of them. Like I'm lucky, right? But there's all these feelings over here. And once they can pinpoint their feelings, then it leads over to a corresponding need that's either being met or not being met. Mm -hmm. being met. So when I can have them access those things and I got to use emoji sheets with these guys. They just, they're clueless, right? Here's an emoji sheet. What are you feeling right now? Oh mm -hmm. God, it's something else. So I usually give most of my new clients like a stack of six emoji sheets to try to cover all the bases. And here you go. Oh, that's actually great though. I too, yeah, but I too was one of them. Mm -hmm. I too was one of them. Yeah, so, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, we, 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 we men, um, it's societally not really appropriate for us to feel our feelings yeah, or to yeah. be able to pinpoint them. Well, yeah. and I think with men, one of the biggest challenges that they have is they end up overworking. They create, they commit suicide through working themselves to death, being depressed. And then they go into an addiction to try to numb out the sense of what's wrong. I did everything that I was taught to do. And again, it's following a story or a script that we do to try to feel like we can fit and belong in the society, but this world is crazy. And if we follow what everyone else is doing, we become food for the machine. And then when we say, I'm no longer feeding that machine, I'm no longer gonna be one of, I call it the sheeple dance. Then we have a chance to follow our own spirit, our own divinity, our own intelligence, which is why I love that question, you know, hold yourself, what brings you joy? Not from your head, but from your body, your body will tell you, and that's your, instant um connection to your spirit right and again we're not taught that we're like if you think i'm cool i'm cool that means i'm going to be a puppet for you and i'm going to go is it good enough is it good enough and that's self-abandonment huge it's mm -hmm. a work. I, I think i think through media and everything like that we're, we're programmed to be in our logical mind you know the next spock you know and you'll be okay if you're as long as you play the spock role but what about this what about this? What about what about what's going on down in, in, in this area here in our solar plexus? What's going on deep in there? And, and 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 somatically having people feel into those sensations. Is it prickly? Is it, you know, got a, is it got a temperature? Like <laughs> you know, getting it into the somatic piece of it all um is is, is something that just really isn't done a lot out there. And I, I, I'm sure you do work with that in your, your hypnosis practice. That's, that's the bridge to the healing process. I use that as the somatic link to the root cause. Where did this come from? Where did this get installed? I'll go feel the feeling, turn it up, got it. And then I'll have them on a, some kind of a transition, whether it's a cloud or something. And then I'll use that link to float them to where that got installed. And then it's cleared completely on. Mm -hmm. Then I'm client down. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, need, I need them to be emotionally um, regulated well enough and trusting themselves to go through it because it's usually 10, 15, 20 minutes of grief. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With, yeah. With some really strong decisions that say I'm bad or someone doesn't like me or no one will ever love me. I remember I had one fellow who showed up here and he was very guarded and very hurting. And, um, he'd been through a few marriages that didn't work out and he would marry the woman, then he would run away and she would be abandoned and disappointed and divorce him, but it cost him a lot of money. I said, this is expensive behavior here. I said, so one day I said, let's go to the root cause of why you have this behavior in relationships. And he was, went to, when he um, was with one of his um, aunties or something, he was a little boy and the woman shrieked at him and said, no one will ever love you. And he was a little boy. And so he then put that on as true. And then once he cleared that, he was a completely different man, met the woman of his dreams and got married. Right. But yeah. it was his subconscious mind was taking over to protect him from being hurt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's all about protection and safety, isn't it? No. Mm -hmm. And when we learn to turn right into the danger and face it, that's where all the victory comes from. But unfortunately, we're conditioned, all of them, all the mental stuff, all the all the stuff that comes through these little weapons of mass distraction here and, and, and the Netflixes and all, and all those kind of things. It's a program. And, and we, we get in, entrenched in this mind program from infancy. These poor kids. I see these kids. My grandkids. 
got these little devicey things and they're just like glued to them. They came out here for a visit and they're just like glued to them. And I'm like, dude, look at the nature I have all around me. Come on, let's go. Yeah, classic conditioning. Oh my God. When I was a child, I didn't have any of this. And all I wanted to do was be outside. Yeah. It's a whole different game now, isn't it? Well, it's people have been brainwashed and hijacked because this puts them in waking hypnosis, uptime trance. This is a trance inducing piece of machinery that makes you feel good. Almost. It doesn't really work. It almost works. So it's like the monkey going to hit the button, 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 button. And so the person has no idea who they are, what their needs are. Um, if they're living in a lie, they just keep going back and back. And it creates a setup for addiction and being alienated and not feeling wanted or loved because this is not able to provide love but it almost does so it's like you know it's a setup and i remember um listening to a therapist years ago saying you have no idea what's coming but when it comes it's going to destroy the population and he was talking about these things this is a brainwashing device i could not agree more yeah I could not agree more and it's like okay so you know you, you talk about the digital realms and things like that and uh, somebody I somebody I was talking to was kind of a wise man, and 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 he said to me, I was talking to him about my book and everything. He's like, Vince, why are you leaning on a system that you don't really believe in? Mm. Oh, I really felt that one, you know. <laughs> and yet here we are. Like, how do we even get our our medicine out to the world unless we're on these digital things? You know, we got my groups and i gotta do this i gotta do that gotta do the, all the other things right and um and and gotta haul, have all your different social media sites have, have have a va in the philippines who's looking after this social media site and that va is looking after this one and just like uh mind boggling <laughs> forget it's it i'm just gonna hire ai it. to do it yeah no. <laughs> i am um, i i have a real hard time with it and i find it very um it's kind of, it has a level of built-in cruelty that doesn't make sense. So it does end up feeling like you're being punished. If you make a mistake, something's wrong. It, it creates that whole, um, you know, you're good, you're bad reward system. It's It has classic conditioning of like, if there's any kind of childhood wounding around not being accepted or appreciated as a child, the subconscious will transfer that to this equipment. And then we'll self-shame, self-guilt, self, you know, create a story about how we're not doing it right. Um, they're not, they're a tool, but it's really easy to damage people that are sensitive. And of course you are sensitive and I am sensitive. I don't use them that much. I, I have a YouTube channel. I don't use that much. Eventually I'm going to start doing some more work with it with regards to teaching people how to have better boundaries. So they actually do not burn out and get sick. Mm. So I was just one of the lucky ones who happened to see your, your YouTubes and uh, they came through a few times. I watched a couple of them right from the beginning to end. And I was like, damn, this is the message. Just got to get out there. Thank it's you. so in tune with what I'm doing right now. It's like, okay, let's get on this. Yeah. 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 And, and sometimes it's like, um, like I found that, that, that two are better than one when it comes to um, doing this sort of thing. Um, mm. So, so it's like, you know, there might even be some kind of collaboration. We'll leave that up to the realm of infinite possibilities. But, but um, you know, just having you have an audience and I have an audience, and now and now through this little collaboration we're doing just on this video, now we can reach a broader uh, spectrum of people, right? Mm -hmm. I would love that. Yeah, I'm really grateful for you to share some time with me mm -hmm. and to share your your passion with me. Mm -hmm. I was like mm -hmm. so happy. Yes, to yeah, I, I, if I could figure it out, I could have played like a little. Mm. Nope, we're getting a little choppy there. That's okay. Not, no. Okay. I'm not sure what you just said. It was a oh, um, I just said I'm really glad to see how well you're doing and sharing your passion and your purpose and your your I call it your carers and your soul's work. Like mm. just seeing you do it is so rewarding because most of the people that I know that I've known from 10 or 15 years ago are they're dead or they're miserable or, you know, they're just not living a purposeful life. They haven't dug deeper and to go like what feeds me. And so, you know, we can't live smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, eating garbage food and putting garbage in our minds and expect things to go well. It's like, you know, whatever we, we, we attune to what is around us. And that sort of defines whether we how we see ourselves and that shows up in our emotions and our behaviors and that determines our life. Right. So yeah, I just, I'm just so oh. grateful to see how well you're doing. A couple of weeks ago, I had a, a sweat lodge and 
there was uh, sun dancers that came from all over BC and some ceremonial leaders. They all traveled in and, and uh, I had, I think I had about 28 people in there and, and it was pretty humbling for me because, uh, you know, I, I'm still relatively new behind the bucket, like maybe six years or something. And, and uh, at round three, the lodge started collapsing down on just my head. Nobody else is just mine. It's just slowly and slowly coming down. <laughs> really? Yeah. So we rebuilt the lodge yesterday. I got up at four thirty. I mean, I always get up at four thirty, but uh, we rebuilt the lodge yesterday, and then and then went in and had a sweat, and uh, didn't really get out of there till about one a.m. So I, I mean, today I when I woke up, I'm like, oh man, I'm still half in the spirit realm here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how am I showing up? You know, so I got to learn uh, to integrate even those kind of things to take a day off for integration, but. I think everything's gone here, gone quite well here today anyway, despite that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, unless you had any more questions, I think um, we're, we're probably, we're probably at time and uh, I super appreciate everything that you're doing in the world. And um, yeah. And let's um, kind of like hold that space open for some more conversations around I would this. Love that. I yeah. Would love that. And I really appreciate you making time for us and to share this and, hope that it helps a few people believe that there's another way that it's not just here's the brick eat the brick <laughs> right yes exactly exactly okay so so many blessings to you germana uh, have yourself a beautiful rest of your day and thank you we'll talk soon thanks vince take care bye